Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel, where I cover vampires, werewolves, and other supernatural creatures. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at another cult classic, Near Dark. This movie was released in 1987 and contains most of the cast from Aliens, which is probably why the actors have such great chemistry. Near Dark was released just a few months after the classic Lost Boys. A lot of people believe that is what led to Near Dark going underappreciated for a long time, although I think the film is pretty well recognized now. In my opinion, what gave the Lost Boys the edge was the rock and roll saxophone guy that looked like a WWE wrestler. Near Dark is considered a western horror. However, in my opinion, I don't think it's a horror movie at all. There's nothing scary about it. That's why I always thought the cover was extremely misleading to people who haven't seen the movie. Anyway, without further ado, let's take a look at the story of Near Dark, this unique vampire curse, and the group of immortal outlaws. If you enjoy videos about vampires and other supernatural creatures, leave a like and subscribe for new videos every week. The beginning of the movie introduces us to the main character, a cowboy named Caleb Colton. While out one night, he meets a mysterious girl named May. She says she's traveling with her family and staying in the RV park nearby. She is acting kind of strange, but the two have a great night together. When driving down the road at night, May tells Caleb to suddenly stop the truck, and they get out. May looks out and says, The night is dark, but blinding. It's dark. I noticed. It's not so bright. It'll blind you. Caleb says he has a surprise for May and takes her to a horse ranch. When he brings May in the pen, the horse begins to freak out and runs away. Caleb is confused and May says that horses don't like her. Suddenly she starts panicking, saying she needs to be home before sunrise. Caleb assumes it's because her parents will be angry, but I think we can guess what's going on. She runs to the truck, gets in, and tells Caleb to hurry up. While driving, she gets increasingly nervous, saying I lost track of time. Caleb is a bit confused why she is nervous all of a sudden. He stops the truck, takes the keys out, and says you have to kiss me if you want to get home. Having no choice, she agrees and the two begin kissing. May had been reluctant to kiss him all night, and I think we're about to find out why. The two are embracing each other, and May can't control herself any longer. She bites Caleb's neck and jumps out of the truck and begins to run away on foot. Caleb attempts to chase after her, but she's too fast. Not superhuman fast, just faster than Caleb. He tries to get back in his truck, but it won't start, so he begins walking home. As he crosses the field to his house, the sun starts to rise. Suddenly, his body starts smoking and smoldering. He's trying to make it back to his house, but he's getting weaker and weaker. His dad and sister can see him walking across the field. Before he can make it to the house, an RV comes speeding onto the field. It drives up to Caleb and the door opens and somebody grabs him, pulling him inside. Then they drive away. God. This is when we first meet the crew. Caleb has the spur of a boot against his throat and they want to kill him. Just when it looks like Caleb is about to meet his end, May jumps in the way and says, you might as well kill me too then. He's been bitten, and he's already turned. Since Caleb has been turned, they decide he has to stay. I mean, they can't have a stray vampire running around. He's turned. He comes with us. Also, Caleb was bitten by May and was fully turned before he could even walk home. So these vampires turn very fast, probably within an hour. The group drives to an enclosed hangar to sleep for the day protected from the sun. Caleb is looking very sick at this point. I'm not sure if this is part of the turning process or he just needs blood. That night when they wake up, Caleb is introduced to the group. The leader is Jesse Hooker. His lover and mother figure of the group is Diamondback. The crazy one that almost killed Caleb with his boot is Severin. Then Homer, and finally May. Five of them in total, and now six because of Caleb. I want to point something out about the casting. This movie features Lance Hendrickson, Bill Paxton, and Jeanette Goldstein. All three of these characters were in the movie Aliens just one year before this. All three of the actors just so happened to really like the film and wanted to be in it, and the directors of Near Dark actually got permission from the director of Aliens to see if it was okay to use such a large part of the cast. He of course agreed and said if they wanted to star in the movie that was no problem. In the end it was a great choice, and I love both of these films, probably mostly because of the cast. There's actually one easter egg in the movie related to Aliens. 
In this scene, you can see a theater in the background, and the movie being played is Aliens. The group decides to give Caleb a week to prove himself, to see if he can live like them. I will be referring to the group as vampires, but it's important to note, the movie never says the word vampire. They also don't have fangs or act like vampires. They act more like a group of bandits running from the law and committing crime out of necessity. This is very in tune with the Western theme. That night, they burn the RV and steal a new vehicle. They probably do this very often to keep the law off their trail and makes them hard to track. While burning the RV, Severin says, Remember those fires we started in Chicago? I didn't know what this was referring to, so I googled fires in Chicago and I'd somehow forgotten about the Great Chicago Fires. This fire destroyed around 3.3 square miles of the city and destroyed over 17,000 structures. I guess Severin is hinting that him and Jesse are responsible for the Great Chicago Fire. This timeline does match up because we later learn that Jesse was born in the 1800s and fought in the American Civil War for the South. The Civil War took place from 1861 to 1865, and the Great Fire of Chicago was in 1871, so just a few years later. The fact that Severin was there too means he is also quite old and may have fought in the war as well. The group drive their new stolen vehicle to a new town. It seems like each night they arrive in a new place, go their separate ways for the night, and meet up back before sunrise. Caleb and May go their own way, and Caleb is feeling very sick at this point. He's still very confused about what's happening. He tells May that he wants to go home, and she just lets him go. But as he's walking away, she says you won't get far. We see what she's talking about very soon. Caleb tries to get a bus ticket back home, but he doesn't have enough money. He looks so sick at this point that a police officer mistakes him for a junkie. The officer says, what do you want, kid? And Caleb says, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. The officer decides to help Caleb and gives him a few dollars so he can afford to get the bus ticket home. The officer had a cut on his hand and when he checks Caleb's eyes, Caleb seems to look at his hand and smells the blood. Then he licks his lips. It's very subtle and you might not even notice this happening. Caleb is obviously getting very hungry. While in the bus station, he buys a snack from the vending machine. When he tries to eat it, he starts gagging and coughing, showing us these vampires cannot consume regular food only blood. Caleb gets on the bus now that he has enough money and he's on his way home. But while driving, he suddenly tells the bus driver to stop and runs off the bus. He barely makes it back to May, crawling on the ground. May allows him to feed from her for now, and that immediately makes him feel better. The blood doesn't just bring him back to normal though. It seems to affect him like a drug. In the behind the scenes documentary, they admit that blood is like a drug to them. Caleb was able to feed from May, in most series, vampires cannot feed from each other, but in Near Dark, it doesn't matter. Caleb was also starving for blood after only one day, so these vampires have to feed very often. After feeding, May tells him to look and listen to the night, and this time, he can see. We as the audience don't get to see how night looks to them, but I'm assuming that by what May says, these vampires have enhanced hearing and night vision. In the behind-the-scenes documentary, Catherine Bigelow, the co-writer and director, said there was another scene filmed with Caleb in the desert discovering these abilities. She described the abilities as being able to see like a wolf or an owl, seeing forever in the pitch black. She also says that these abilities come alive at night, suggesting that vampires would be weaker during the day. Now that May has turned Caleb, she has someone to share this experience with. At the beginning of the movie, she wanted Caleb to look and listen to the night, but he couldn't, and this frustrated her. The movie obviously uses feeding on blood as an allegory for addiction, but it's done quite well. It might be a little on the nose in the bus station scene, but that's okay. Meanwhile, back home, his father is working with the local police, trying to figure out who took his son. Unfortunately, the police are not much help, and he goes out to look on his own. The next night, Caleb tries to call home to talk to his dad, but there's no answer, because he's out looking for Caleb. Tonight, the group wants Caleb to make a kill, to prove he is one of them. Caleb is scared and doesn't want to kill anyone, but May talks him down. She says they can be together and do anything they want until the end of time, but he has to learn to kill. If not, he will die. We see Homer kills someone by pretending that he was hit by a car. Jesse and Diamondback are almost victims of a carjacking, but those criminals chose the wrong car. Severin dresses up in his best clothes and uses his seductive charm to lure a couple of women. 
Now, it's Caleb's turn. Caleb tries to bring himself to kill the truck driver, but he can't do it, and jumps out of the truck. May is forced to kill the truck driver and drinks his blood. Since a simple bite will turn someone, they have to make sure they kill their victims to prevent them from turning. The group meets back up and they're riding on a train now. Everyone is very angry that Caleb didn't make a kill. Homer says that he doesn't have what it takes. He's not one of us. Caleb knows he's right. He's no killer, and he has no idea how he will bring himself to do it. Severin wants to kill Caleb right now and be done with him, but Jesse holds him back and says, one more night. He turns to Caleb and says it's not fair May having to carry you. You need to make a kill tonight. Now we finally arrive at the famous bar scene. Hands down the best part of the movie. Bill Paxton's character really gets to shine here, although he is one of the best parts of this movie from start to finish. The entrance to the bar and the music is iconic. As soon as they arrive, Severin starts causing trouble. He purposely spills a patron's drink and tells him to lick it up off the floor. Then he somehow diffuses the situation, only to immediately spit a drink in the patron's face. He gets up to fight and Severin pulls Caleb in front of the punch. Then he says, keep hitting him, I'm trying to show the boy something. The man punches Caleb several times and Severin lets him go. Caleb is angry now. He punches the man once, then the second punch sends him flying back several feet slamming into the pool table. Caleb stands there amazed and says, did I do that? I guess Severin wanted to show Caleb now that he's turned, he can take one hell of a beating and it looks like he has super strength as well. As for speed, they are the same as humans. No quicksilver speed here. Even the increased strength isn't over the top. They keep these vampires abilities pretty grounded in reality. No compulsion, no flying, nothing really magic. Jesse then kills the waiter. Well, actually Diamondback kills her before Jesse gets the chance. The bartender asks what they want, and Jesse says, Just a few more minutes of your time, about the same time as the rest of your life. Severin is having a great time and starts messing with another bar patron that looks like a biker. The biker pulls a knife and says don't mess with me, but Severin slaps it out of his hand effortlessly, and the biker becomes afraid. He tries to choke Severin, but it's no use. I love when he grabs the guy's sunglasses while he's being strangled and puts them on. Severin then grabs the man's head and breaks his neck. This whole time, the bartender has been silently loading his gun. He pulls it out and shoots Caleb in the stomach. <laughs> There's a kick, ain't it? Severin tells Caleb to sit down and let him handle this. He jumps up on the counter, scaring the bartender and tormenting him. Just before the bartender can load his gun, Severin yells and begins slashing the man's throat with the knife on his boot. I like that each time he slashes, you can hear the spurs on his boots. <coughs> Severin is the most brutal of the group by far. Caleb can't bring himself to kill. The opposite is Severin, who can't help himself but kill. Not only that, but he enjoys playing with his food like a cat. The man that Caleb punched finally wakes up and tries to leave the bar. Diamondback steps in his way and says there's a fly on the ceiling. He looks up and I figured she was going to slash his throat, but Homer pulls out a pistol and shoots him in the back several times. There's one patron left in the bar and he's for Caleb. It's time he makes his first kill. Also, he's already healed from the shotgun, so these vampires have a very good healing ability. The last patron jumps out the window and attempts to run away. Caleb chases him and manages to catch him, but he can't bring himself to do it and lets the man go. A moment later, Jesse and the group pull up and tell Caleb to get in. Done for the last time, boy. Sorry. Yeah? Jesse says, you really messed up this time. That guy that got away will be going to the law, and they will be looking for this van. They have no time to punish Caleb right now, though, because they spent more time at the bar than they intended, and now the sun is about to rise. They race as fast as they can to a nearby hotel and Jesse books a room. While talking to the owner, he says, Didn't you stay here a lot of years ago? Jesse says, Yeah, I like to stop by every 50 years or so. Make me a reservation. They made it to the room safely and go to sleep for the day. But they are awoken by the sound of banging on the door. It's the police. Jesse was right. The kid went to the police and led them here. The vampires have no plans on coming peacefully and Severin decides it's time to go. Check out time. A massive firefight ensues between the vampires and the local police. 
The gunshots are creating holes in the motel, allowing sunlight to pour through. When the vampires are hit by the sunlight, they immediately catch fire, even through their clothing. They try to wear what they can to protect themselves from the sun, but even heavy clothing is only partial protection. During this ordeal, Homer was by far the most afraid of the sun. Maybe he once had a bad experience. Caleb decides to make a run for the van through the sun. The group thinks he's crazy, but agrees to cover him. Caleb jumps through the window and the group lays down cover fire. He uses a blanket to cover himself from the sun. But like I said, clothing only provides partial protection. Even though he's technically covered, he still begins to smoke and eventually bursts into flames. He makes it to the van and drives it through the wall of the motel, allowing them all to get in and drive away. They are a little burnt, but still alive. They drive to another motel and get a room there. The group is ready to kill Caleb after he let that guy go. But after saving everyone, they have a change of heart. Jesse says, you just bought yourself some time, kid. Severin, the most brutal of all, even comes around to Caleb. He gives him one of his beloved spurs from his boots. Maybe most impressive is Homer, who thanks Caleb and shakes his hand. Diamondback also approves. This is when Caleb asks Jesse how old he is. Jesse only says, well, I fought for the South. We lost. <laughs> we don't know exactly when he was born, but if he was born in the mid-1800s, he would be roughly 140 years old. That's based on if he was in his late 20s when the war started. In the behind-the-scenes documentary, Lance Hendrickson said he sewed a Confederate flag on the inside of his coat. I'm not sure if we ever get a good shot of it in the movie, but you can see it in pictures. Homer goes for a walk outside to have a cigarette. He hears something at the vending machine. It's a young girl. This is actually Caleb's sister. Her and her dad are driving around looking for Caleb and ended up at this motel. He invites her back to the room to watch TV, having no idea who she is. Homer often talks about being an old man trapped in a child's body, but he still acts like a child sometimes. Although he wants to appear older, he never really got a chance to be a kid, so he's stuck in an in-between world. Diamondback asks the girl where her parents are staying, and she tells them her dad is in a room downstairs. Severin immediately gets up to go to the room to retrieve her dad. I'm assuming this was because they thought Homer was going to kill her, so they would need to kill the family to avoid someone looking for her. Eventually, the girl named Sarah gets bored and wants to leave. When she walks toward the door, it flings open and Caleb sees his sister. He hugs her and a moment later, Severin arrives with his father. Caleb says he tried to call and his dad tells him that they've been out looking for him. Caleb assumes that they will let his family go. He quickly realizes he's wrong. Also, Homer now wants to turn Caleb's younger sister out of jealousy. We learn he was the one who turned May, but May fell in love with Caleb and that probably pissed him off. Most likely, he was hoping that he would have a relationship like Jesse and Diamondback. Homer even says, you took May, I take your sister, then we'll be even. Luckily, Caleb's sister opens the door, allowing light to spill in and Caleb escapes with his family under a blanket. Caleb's dad wants to know what the hell is going on. He wants to take Caleb to the hospital, but Caleb says, no, you can't take me there. Caleb then asks his father if he can do a blood transfusion. For some reason, his dad does know how and gives a blood transfusion to Caleb, and this cures his vampirism. I noticed while editing, there is one shot of his dad in the beginning with a stethoscope working on some animals, so I guess he's some kind of veterinarian. The next day, he is human again and can walk in the sun. I guess the vampirism was something in his blood, like a virus, and by replacing enough of it, he became human again. The only problem with this is how did Caleb just come up with this idea? It just comes out of left field that he wants a blood transfusion and boom, he's cured. It's kind of an easy out. Just when everything seems like it's going to go back to normal, May arrives at his house. The two embrace and May realizes that Caleb is warm. He's human again. So I guess that tells us that vampires have a low body temperature. He says that he belongs here with his family and she runs away. When he goes back inside, his sister has been taken by the vampires. I don't know why they wouldn't just move on, but I guess these vampires have nothing better to do. Caleb goes after his sister on his horse, and the final showdown begins. When Caleb arrives, he is thrown off his horse. Remember earlier when the horse seen May? Caleb should have remembered that horses freak out near vampires. 
Caleb is getting beat up and tries to wave down a truck driving by. Severin kills the driver, so Caleb jumps inside and runs Severin over. That's one vampire down. Or maybe not. Severin climbs up on the hood, covered in blood, half of his face completely destroyed. These vampires are very tough. Severin is still laughing and doesn't seem to care at all. He starts ripping wires out of the engine bay of the truck. This is when Caleb purposely jackknifes the truck and jumps out, causing it to explode and finally kill Severin. When he gets run over, this is the version of him that's featured on the cover. Cast members mentioned in the BTS documentary that the original poster was odd, because he only briefly appears like that and it's not indicative of the film. I couldn't agree more. I didn't watch this film for the longest time because of the cover. It really makes it seem like a horror movie when it's not like that at all. Probably one of the most misleading covers I've ever seen. In the BTS documentary, Bill Paxton also tells a funny story that when he was still in that makeup and he was going home, him and Lance Hendrickson scared the crap out of a train driver saying there was an accident and he walked out with that makeup on. The train pulled in and we had stopped shooting the scene and Bill, Bill says, watch this. He goes up, there's a, uh, one of the conductors is standing on the side of the train. And Bill went up and said, there's been a terrible accident. Please, can you call somebody? And, hey, man, there's been an accident. This guy just turned white as a ghost. Well, it probably wasn't very funny, but we were, we were into, uh, you know, pulling pranks. and have, We had a lot of fun with these personas. Lance Hendrickson also told a story of being in the Jesse Hooker makeup and costume and picking up a hitchhiker on the way to film and purposely trying to scare the crap out of him to get his character down. If you really enjoy this movie and haven't seen that behind the scenes documentary, you definitely need to check it out. Anyway, back to the movie. Caleb jackknifing the truck was kind of set up earlier. When he was hitchhiking earlier and him and May were picked up by the truck driver, he was teaching Caleb how to drive his rig. He told Caleb that you have to break the trailer first or else you will jackknife. Caleb now has a showdown with the rest of the group. The end of the movie is when a lot of Western themes come out. He rides the horse into town and they have a big standoff. Diamondback tries to sneak up behind Caleb, but his sister tells him to look out just in time. Caleb ducks and the knife hits Jesse right in the mouth. This is when something strange happens. Caleb grabs his sister and Diamondback lets him go. Jesse tries to shoot Caleb while he's running away, but May pushes him so he misses. Caleb tries to run all the way home carrying his sister, but the vampires jumped in their car and they catch up to them in no time. They recapture his sister and begin driving away. While driving down the road trying to cover up from the sun, May has a change of heart. She grabs Sarah and jumps out the back window of the car, picking Caleb over the vampires. I think she still loved her vampire family, but she was done with this life. Sarah and May begin running toward Caleb. Homer also jumps out of the car, chasing after them, saying, Sarah, come back. He must have really wanted to turn Sarah. Earlier in the movie, it's established that he is extremely afraid of the sun, more so than the other vampires. So for him to get out of the car and chase after Sarah shows how much he wanted her. He probably wanted to turn someone that was a child like him, so he would have someone to relate with and understand what he's going through. Being an adult, trapped in a child's body. Caleb covers May with the blanket to protect her from the sun. Homer is now fully engulfed in flame and explodes. I guess when a vampire is exposed to the sun for long enough, they turn into a bomb. This is their only weakness mentioned in the movie. As far as we know, they're not weak to a stake through the heart, holy objects, garlic or silver, just sunlight. The director and co-writer Kathleen Bigelow said she wanted to keep it simple. Light versus dark. It does really help keep you more focused on the story, having the vampire lore not be all convoluted. The fire effects on Homer are probably the only visual effect that doesn't hold up today. And it's not even that bad. It's definitely serviceable. The burnt skin effect really helps save it. Earlier in the movie during the gunfight, they used real fire for those effects and it looked great. <laughs> Jesse and Diamondback are still in the car and the sun is getting to them. They accept their fate and hold hands as they go up in flames. May survived the final battle and Caleb gives her a blood transfusion to cure her as well. She wakes up a little afraid of what she will do now that she's human, but Caleb is there to help. I really enjoy this movie and I like the ending. 
I will say this ending seems a bit out of place with the rest of the movie. It feels like a movie that would have an everybody dies ending. I think possibly the best ending would have been somewhere in the middle, where the group is killed but Caleb and May remain vampires, ready to start the cycle of creating a vampire family all over again. It just seems a little too convenient that in a movie that was so dark up until this point, that he gets cured, cures his love interest and everybody lives happily ever after. Like I said, I like the happy ending. I just think for overall quality of the movie, a little darker ending probably would have served the movie better. Also, have Caleb discover the vampire cure in a more organic way. Something that's never directly discussed in the movie is what order they were turned in. Jesse is the oldest. He turned Diamondback to be his lover. It's not exactly clear if he turned Diamondback or Severin first, because we know Severin has been with Jesse since the 1870s. Homer was turned by Diamondback, and May was turned by Homer. In the behind the scenes documentary, Lance Hendrickson said that he had his own idea of how his character became a vampire. That was something I always wondered, because Jesse was the oldest. So who turned him? Lance said he pitched the idea to Catherine Bigelow and she enjoyed it. His idea was during the Civil War. He was in the Navy. His ship was attacked and pummeled with cannon fire. It was torn to shreds and the men were floating in the water. He could hear the screams of fellow officers as they were being killed by mystical sirens. That's what turned him. A siren of the water. At least that was Lance Hendrickson's idea for Jesse's origin. A pretty good idea, I think. And he obviously really liked the character in the movie to have gone through all the effort to think that up and remember it. Bill Paxton also had a kind of idea for a backstory about his character. He said possibly the reason that Jesse turned Severin is because Jesse lost his kid brother in the war and Severin reminded him of his brother. Neither of those stories are canon, as he would say. They're just stories made up by the actors themselves for their characters, and I thought they were pretty cool. I always enjoy a movie that doesn't romanticize the life of vampires. I think vampires like the ones from The Strain, Blade 2, or 30 Days of Night are some of my favorites because you don't want to be them. Near Dark also has this effect. The vampires are low-life outlaws, with no money, constantly running from the law. No fancy gothic mansions like in The Vampire Chronicles or Underworld. I also like when vampire movies don't use the word vampire. Not that much attention is given to the vampire's origin, or if it's a disease, curse, etc. It's not the focus of the film, just a motif for the rest of the story, a lens to see the story through. The movie kinda reminds me of From Dusk Till Dawn, in the way that it combines genres in such an interesting way. Western and vampire biopic. It's a shame that the marketing for this movie was done so poorly and it had to go up against The Lost Boys. Even Catherine Bigelow herself said the marketing for Near Dark was handled poorly and the Lost Boys had a massive machine behind it. At least over the years, it has gained the recognition it deserves. And she said that now, Near Dark is often the movie she's asked about the most and receives the most praise. Not to mention, it was her first film that she had written and directed. That's my video on Near Dark. This is such a great movie and would probably be in my top 10 vampire movies of all time. If you like 80s movies, the cast of Aliens, and good storytelling, you might like this film too. Honestly, I can't recommend it enough. If there's any movies or TV shows you want me to cover, please leave them in the comments down below. I love reading through your suggestions, and I've found so many great movies and shows with your help. If you enjoyed, leave a like, and subscribe if you haven't. I upload videos every week and I really appreciate it. I'm currently trying to reach 200k and we're almost there. As always, thanks so much to all my members for going the extra mile. It means a lot that you've went out of your way to be a part of the channel. I'm going to have some more polls and possibly some more members videos coming soon. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.